Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome friends to this lecture on Ram Manohar Lohia and through Ram Manohar Lohia we will try to uh, study some of the key uh, issues of uh, uh, Indian politics and uh, uh, the issues has uh, very significant uh, status even in our modern um, um, uh, uh, contemporary political uh, discourse. So, from Ram Manohar Lohia, we will try to study his, um, uh, we will focus his views on caste and class and also his views on Indian language. So, we will have three lectures on uh, Ram Manohar Lohia. Today, we are going to engage with his um, uh, politics, his public life or political life or Lohia as a thinker or some of the philosophical position he took um, uh, on many social, political as well as the uh, philosophical issues. So, we will focus more on uh, these, uh, this side of uh, Lohia as a thinker in today's class or in the next lecture we will focus uh, on his views on caste and class and also through that we will look at his ideas of so uh, socialism and his distinct interpretation of socialism. And in the final lecture, we will um, examine his views on language and finally, we will conclude um, um, this um, uh, 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 lecture or um, that lecture on um, uh, Lohia by critically evaluating uh, some of his thought and uh, thinking. So, um, Lohia uh, in many ways um, um, is a very fascinating modern Indian political thinker or his space or his um, uh, ideas has a unique space in the history of modern Indian political thought. And it is so in many ways. In uh, Lohia, we find a kind of combination of nationalism, Marxism or socialism and uh, yet uh, there is a kind of innovative independent thinking or theorization about uh, being inspired by these uh, uh, traditions or these intellectual uh, thought and yet independent uh, 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 in one's own thought when it comes to theorizing about Indian society, Indian polity and what should be the future of Indian society and how we can achieve that uh, society. So, uh, in Ram Manohar Lohia, he was a very strong um, nationalist. Uh, inspired by many Gandhian ideals and also the uh, writings of Marx and in Indian context he uh, helped in theorization of socialism in a very distinct and unique way free from what now it is and in this um, um, uh, um, uh, course we have begin with uh, to um, uh, look at those concepts or methods which will allow us to move away from excessive reliance on Eurocentricism or uh, European domination or hegemony in knowledge production. In Lohia, we find uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, um, uh, uh, approach to uh, devise or to conceptualize a politics which is free from the um, Eurocentric um, um, uh, approach or Euro, uh, Eurocentric um, methods. And his understanding of uh, uh, socialism, therefore, was rooted in the Indian reality, Indian society, Indian culture, Indian myths, folklores, and a lot of things. So, his understanding, his approach to politics as well as knowledge production or theorization of politics was a kind of shift and that we see in our contemporary intellectual uh, 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 scholarly 
debates when we now try to provincialize Europe or try to um, um, criticize the Eurocentricism of the knowledge production, Lohia was trying to do it in the immediately after the uh, political independence of the uh, um, uh, 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 political independence from the British uh, rule. So Lohia has a many uh, philosophical uh, or uh, theoretical contribution in conceptualizing socialism rooted in Indian tradition, rooted in Indian realities and free from the uh, uh, western domination or Eurocentric uh, approach and therefore he was very critical of the both models of uh, uh, development be it communism or uh, capitalism and uh, he, uh, uh, he championed or uh, fought for the socialism. And his socialism was very different from many other kind of socialism say democratic socialism or Fabian socialism that was being argued by many thinkers and leaders in India. The other significance of Lohia and his thought is his views on caste and caste as a root cause for social and economic equality in India. So, uh, and there he differed from many left um, uh, or the communist uh, groups and their understanding of economic inequality and the uh, uh, method to fight for that, uh, that inequality. For Lohia, the caste is the root cause of such social and economic inequality and that uh, he wanted to um, uh, destroy. And for that he also um, um, uh, tried to collaborate with Ambedkar and he was a kind of bridge between Ambedkar and Gandhi in, um, in post Indian, in, in, uh, the world view or the politics of Gandhian on the one hand or Ambedkarites on the other. Lohia tried to collaborate or a kind of bridge between these, uh, these two world views or uh, uh, approach to the, uh, post, uh, to the politics in modern India. The other um, 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 interesting um, uh, uh, thought in uh, Lohia is his approach to the language. So many uh, caricature of Lohia that we have is about uh, he being chauvinist or supporter of uh, Hindi and fought against the English. But his uh, critique to English was not about uh, the language as such, but the uh, hierarchy or the uh, feudal status of uh, English vis-a-vis -vis Indian languages or those who can speak, uh, uh, study or um, um, think in Indian languages. So, uh, he wanted to promote Indian language and therefore, he criticized English because it created a divide, it created a kind of hierarchy in the society. But, uh, so um, in other words, when it comes to engage with uh, Lohia, there is a kind of um, uh, um, approach where on the one hand, he is regarded mainly by his followers as a kind of um, um, prophet or a, a thinker who is beyond any kind of a scrutiny. So, there is a kind of uh, loyalty or a kind of uncritical uh, following of Lohia and his thought and using some of his slogans to understand uh, Indian society, Indian politics. The other kind of um, um, uh, groups who, who are really silent or a kind of uncritical engagement with Lohia and his thought even when his thoughts and concepts are very relevant in our contemporary politics. The um, uh, repercussions or the consequences of Lohia can be seen in the electoral politics also. So, many um, um, socialist party like Samajwadi party or Janta Dal United or their leaders may claim or Ramila's past one may claim their um, uh, um, or may assert their allegiance to Lohia and his philosophy. But in actual uh, politics of these parties, the many ideals that uh, Lohia stood for or fought for is simply absent. So, Lohia in a way present a kind of very uh, fascinating um, uh, thought or ideas for us to engage with one of the very fascinating uh, development in modern Indian political thinking about society, socialism, uh, caste, class and use of language to uh, create a society which is more just, more equitable or more inclusive. So, Lohia in that sense remain a very fascinating thinker and we need to uh, beyond these caricatures or uh, selective appropriation or silencing of uh, uh, Lohia and his thought 
to engage more critically and subject uh, his thoughts and ideas to our critical scrutiny and to take his ideas forward to understand which ideas are applicable and which ideas are not applicable and which uh, concepts were limited to his times uh, alone. So, these are some of the things we will discuss over the course of this three lecture on um, uh, Raman or Lohia. So, Lohia being visionary as many political uh, thinkers in modern India were, he uh, uh, often quoted this uh, uh, line that log meri baat sunenge zarur lekin mere marne ke baad. In that sense, it gives us a kind of very prophetic self assessment by any thinker. So, in Tagore, we have seen how he many times uttered his um, a kind of misfit or a kind of his own position in the larger unfolding of political uh, happenings. Similarly, in Nehru, we see a kind of queer mixture of West and East and his own search for uh, locating himself in the larger uh, society and politics of India. Similarly, uh, in uh, Ram Manohar Lohia, we see his uh, own assessment of his thought and its relevance in the time and he uh, many times real, uh, realized that many of the thinking or theorization that he was uh, involved in was much ahead of that time and many of even many of uh, his followers were in his assessment not able to uh, uh, fully grasp or comprehend the ideas or the uh, 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 thought he was um, uh, arguing for. So, uh, he stated that and it is very much true now after this birth sanitary of Lohia in 19 uh, in 2010, there is a kind of re uh, uh, retrieval of Lohia and re-engagement with Lohia and this has happened in many other thinkers also. So, we have seen in Ambedkar after the independence for many decades, there is a kind of uh, conspicuous silence about Ambedkar and his legacy. Only after 90s, uh, there is a kind of reassertion of Ambedkarites movement and um, uh, new scholarships about Ambedkar and, in, in, and his ideas. Similarly, with uh, uh, Lohia also, after 2010, there is a kind of resurgence of literature, scholarly debates, discussions and publication on Lohia and his thought. So, there is a kind of uh, uh, increasing um, uh, acknowledgement of the relevance of Lohia and his thought in our uh, contemporary politics. One reason for that is also uh, Lohia was the uh, most uh, vocal uh, critique of Congress party and its hegemony in the first or the second decades of um, independence and he played a crucial role in forming alliance of uh, non-Congress party to form the government after the fourth uh, general election. So, Lohia did play a very significant role, but in his ideas, in his philosophical uh, approach also, uh, he remains very relevant and there is now a kind of uh, uh, re-engagement or a kind, uh, a kind of uh, critical engagement with Lohia and his thought in our contemporary times. So, he was an activist thinker who was as with many other modern Indian political thinker deeply embedded in the politics of their time. So, was Lohia, but they were also uh, very reflective about the present or the future of Indian society, uh, the struggles that they have uh, to undertake or the vision they had for India and the humanity as a whole. So, Raman or Lohia was an activist thinker and a, a very prominent leader of socialist politics in modern India. He actively took part in the movement towards Indian independence and was devoted to fight injustices throughout his life. Now, this uh, devotion to fighting injustice against all form of injustices, be it political, social, economic, racial, gender, caste, he was engaged and uh, therefore, uh, in his uh, philosophical approach also, when there is a domination operations. So, the uh, fight against such domination and oppression cannot be um, uh, led or cannot be based or um, uh, 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 limited to a one set of agenda, whether it is class uh, as in uh, uh, left uh, or communist approach, uh, uh, the class as the uh, criteria or as the agent for revolution or transformation. For uh, Lohia, there has to be a multiple. 
uh, ways or multiple agent of fighting different kind of injustices and all those kind of injustices has to fought has to fought simultaneously and not you know uh, reducing uh, or uh, giving priority to one form of injustices over the other form of injustices. So, fighting injustices in all form uh, was some of the um, um, major um, uh, engagement of uh, uh, Lohia and Lohiaites politics and he remained committed to such um, uh, struggle against injustices throughout his life uh, uh, which, uh, uh, which also uh, allowed him to think about uh, uh, democracy or democratic imaginary in a very part, uh, very different way than those who were fighting the British, but when they acquired the power they were actually behaving more or less like the uh, uh, British. So, he developed a very critical outlook because of his lifelong devotion to fighting injustices in all forms and uh, developing a very unique and distinct approach to fight those injustices without being guided by uh, a particular uh, uh, way of looking at injustices and the uh, identifying the agent who will fight such injustices. So, Lohia is a very different uh, unique thinker in many ways. So, critical of both capitalism and communism, Lohia formulated a very distinct Indian version of socialism. This we will discuss more in the later lectures. So, he argued for an indigenous and the nationalist in Lohia is also therefore very evident in his thought, in his thinking. And this nationalism is also not that uncritical nationalism of a kind of uh, uh, narrow, uh, chauvinistic uh, or jingoistic kind of nationalism. So, Lohia uh, was deeply ro rooted in Indian uh, 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 sensibilities or Indian culture or Indian uh, uh, traditions of thought and thinking and yet he was very uh, uh, critical in his approach uh, to the nationalism, but uh, he was also deeply influenced by uh, the indigenities or the uh, indigenous mode of thinking and politics. So, to understand or to fight against injustices in a particular society, one needs to understand that society and understanding of that society cannot be complete or holistic if we are uh, guided by borrowed concepts or ideas and therefore, his focus was on the indigenous concepts vocabulary to understand those injustices and then fight for it. Uh, fight against those injustices. So, he argued for an indigenous solution to the Indian problems which is free from Eurocentric influences that was the case by the modernist elite in India. So, Lohia vision and claims over his thoughts remain tested and debated in the larger Indian philosophical and political thoughts which I have just discussed that his legacy and um, uh, his ideas. Uh, is um, um, blindly followed by many of his uh, loyal, uh, uh, loyal followers who do not want to um, subject his ideas to any uh, uh, rational, logical, uh, critical scrutiny. On the other hand, there are large number of uh, uh, groups who are conspicuously silent about the relevance of uh, Lohia and his thought. However, the uh, ideas, the concepts or the approach Lohia had is becoming more and more relevant in our contemporary times than it was perhaps uh, in his time and therefore, this quotation from Lohia. Besides in active politics, Lohia was primarily a man of ideas. This is not to say that his short life that is from 1910 to 1967 was bereft of actions. He was involved during the Quit India movement, the movement for democracy in Nepal and in many other political and social activities. So, he was a man of ideas who was deeply engaged and involved in transforming the society and therefore, in the Lohia the immanence or the present is as important and perhaps uh, more important than any approach or politics which talks about distant future or distant past. So, uh, Lohia was engaged or embedded in the present or the requirements of the present or the struggles in the present for transforming the society. So, for every single moment or act in the present is uh, very uh, um, um, uh, crucial 
for Lohiite kind of politics where there is a kind of piecemeal or kind of um, gradual approach to uh, create an egalitarian society or a uh, uh, just society or ideal society. However, his objective of building a strong socialist movement in India did not materialize which we have seen in the scholarly debates or intellectual debates also and also in the politics or the, in the electoral politics largely uh, the ideals or ideas of Lohia is absent besides merely a kind of symbolic use of Lohia's, uh, Lohia and his uh, slogans by many of his followers uh, like Samajwadi party or uh, Janata Dal United. So, the socialist party he was part of has splintered and lost its direction and vitality as an alternative force in Indian politics. So, immediately after the independence socialism or socialist party provided a kind of hope or a kind of alternative to the Congress or to, uh, to the left. But gradually as we have seen the politics that has unfolded, uh, the socialist party lost its direction and also splintered in many uh, fractions, many groups, uh, time and again they come together to form a kind of um, alliance. But uh, in that um, uh, coming together, the ideas that can force them together or a direction that they can take is uh, 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 never uh, uh, has never been materialized because the uh, ideals or the uh, um, uh, uh, approach that uh, uh, Lohia or the vision that he was talking about is simply absent in the electoral uh, arithmetics or electoral coalition that we uh, see among many so called socialist parties uh, in India. So, now certainly in our contemporary politics we see the socialist party as an alternative force is simply ineffective in the actual politics. However, his ideas and formulations have survived and are perhaps more relevant today than it was during his time as I was saying many of his approach against the dynastic or the dominance of one party over the other to rescue the democracy, to democratize the society, uh, to uh, uh, criticize the Eurocentricism or reliance on Eurocentric ideas and concepts to understand or interpret Indian uh, realities. So, many of his uh, thoughts and ideas and his uh, uh, formulation of socialism are perhaps more relevant today than it was in his time. His ideas did change the grammar of Indian politics. So, one of the significant influence of Lohia and his politics to a great extent was the rise of OBC, other backward caste in northern India and um, in uh, the grammar or in the vocabulary of Indian politics, uh, he is considered as the, um, um, as the leader or as the kind of um, visionary of OBC uh, or politics, uh, uh, politics or to fight for the OBC reservation through Mandal and certainly after the Mandal the rise of silent revolution as Christoph Jefferlet is talking about. So, um, uh, Lohia has greatly influenced such kind of uh, uh, political uh, development uh, as well. So, uh, his influence in changing the grammar of politics and the role of OBC and uh, their leadership in the uh, Indian politics is now a reality. It the, uh, they have become more and more effective or providing leadership in different states and different uh, uh, parts of the country in the government, in the administration or in uh, all work of social and uh, public political life. So, um, uh, Lohia did uh, play a significant role uh, in providing both the ideological and the organizational base for such politics to emerge particularly in North India and also in some other, uh, other parts of the country. So, he provided a kind of new vocabulary or new structure or uh, organization uh, 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 for uh, the backward caste uh, to, uh, uh, to um, develop their politics from the uh, base which uh, Lohia meticulously built immediately after the first or the second decades of independence. According to Yogendra Yadav, the reasons for Lohia and his ideals absence from our contemporary public political discourse for a very long time and especially after his death 
was largely due to what he called three sins he committed. First, Lohia attacked Nehru. Often, this attack was personal. That is not to say they do not share any cordial relationship. In fact, when uh, Lohia was part of Congress Socialist Party and working within the uh, Congress to fight for the freedom, uh, uh, they were uh, inspired by Nehru and his vision of a socialist um, uh, uh, society or uh, state. However, after the independence, uh, this um, um, uh, relationship between Lohia and um, um, uh, uh, Nehru becomes more acrimonious and in many occasions, um, uh, Lohia launched a personal attack on Nehru which was the reason for many Congress leaders or Congress party to uh, silence or to, uh, to um, limit Lohia and his um, uh, writings in the post-independent political development or political discourse, most certainly after his death. Often personally at that time when Nehru was uh, like good, like so this was one of his sins what Yogendra Yadav calls. The second is his vigorous and voluble campaign against English. So his campaign for Indian languages, support for the Hindi as the official language is now caricatured as his chauvinistic attitude to language which uh, is seen or reduced to be seen as a mere opposition to English. But as I have said, his approach to um, uh, language and language issue which we will discuss in uh, one separate lecture is to fight against the hierarchy, the feudal status of uh, English as a privileged language or a, uh, uh, giving a kind of privilege uh, in comparison to the Indian language. So, he did support Hindi and he also supported many Indian languages. He wanted uh, different Indian languages to communicate with each other directly without relying to a third language. So, he was a more kind of democratic approach to the issue of language, democratizing the language or uh, um, uh, removing the hierarchy that is there between English, a foreign language or uh, the Indian languages. But uh, unfortunately, it is seen or it is projected as his anti-English uh, stand uh, and not the uh, larger democratic approach that he uh, had against the uh, uh, English. So, his campaign against English is also one of the sins he committed and that leads to his marginalization or his not a serious engagement with his thoughts and ideas. And also his questioning of upper caste dominance in Indian politics after the independence and support for caste based affirmative action. So, his famous um, slogan, saw me sad, that is 60 percent in every sphere of social political life of India should be reserved for this backward caste and community. So, these are three of the sins according to Yogendra Yadav which uh, did not allow uh, or which uh, work uh, as major reasons for his um, silencing or um, uh, conspicuous silence against Lohia and his thought in our not just political discourse, despite many followers, many parties showing their allegiance to Lohia, but also in the scholarly uh, debates. But that is now something which is changing and people are now seriously uh, uh, trying to retrieve some of the relevant ideas uh, in Lohia and also subjecting his ideas to critical scrutiny and then try to figure out the uh, relevant uh, or, or um, uh, relevance of uh, Lohia and his thought for the modern politics. Now, if you look at the personal and political uh, life of Lohia, he was born on March 23, 1910 in Akbarpur in Uttar Pradesh to a family of merchants and uh, following the death of his mother when he was two, uh, Lohia was primarily raised by his grandparents and his father's commitment to Indian nationalism influenced him greatly during his childhood and he remains a, a staunch nationalist and that nationalism is also again a critical uh, uh, nationalist, no a kind of narrow chauvinistic kind of nationalism, but he remained despite of his leaning to socialist kind of politics a strong nationalist which he inherited from his father, from his family. And he attended Banaras Hindu University 
before earning a bachelor's degree from University of Calcutta and for a PhD he went to University of Berlin where he studied economics and politics. So this is his educational qualification and his going to uh, Germany for higher education when the trend was everyone going to uh, Britain to, uh, uh, to earn a degree in law or to do a PhD, um, um, Lohia chose to go to Germany and did uh, his uh, PhD from there. And in uh, many ways, uh, the uh, ideas or the philosophical foundation of his thought was shaped by his um, uh, stay in German as a student and to um, uh, witness the emergence of um, uh, fascist kind of uh, politics and also the writings of Marx and others were uh, deeply influential in shaping uh, many of his own thoughts and ideas. Lohia belonged to the generation of leaders who came to limelight in the wake of Quit India movement. So, Jai Prakash Narayan was their leader and they founded the Congress Socialist Party within the Congress in 1934. So, he was very actively engaged in the socialist politics from the very beginning. Both Jai Prakash Narayan and Lohia grew close to Gandhi in the last decades of his life. Even when the older generation like Nehru and Sardar, Patel, Maulan Azad was becoming more impatient with the Mahatma Gandhi. So, it was also to be noted that when there was celebration of independence in many parts of the country, Lohia was along with uh, Gandhi to uh, fight for, uh, to uh, work for communal harmony or to um, um, provide solace to the Wound, uh, uh, wounded souls or uh, uh, individuals who were the victims of uh, uh, communal rights in different parts of the country. So, they grew more closer to Gandhi and the Gandhian influence is also very fascinatingly one can uh, uh, see is more influential in the socialist politics whether it is uh, the politics of uh, Jayaprakash Narayan or uh, Lohia than perhaps in the uh, uh, statistic or a statist politics of uh, uh, the Congress party, although they uh, did uh, uh, claim to uh, represent or to uh, uh, influence by the Gandhian ideals, but uh, Lohia and Jay Prakash Narayan certainly came closer to Gandhi and his thought even when the older generation of the Congress like Nehru, Patel we are becoming more impatient with Gandhi and his thought. So, in uh, 1934, Lohia became actively involved in Congress Socialist Party, which was founded that year as a left wing group within the Indian National Congress. So, there is also within the Congress, certainly with uh, Nehru or Subhash Chandra Bose, there is a tilt towards more left uh, oriented politics or to think about uh, creating a egalitarian society free from all kind of discrimination based on caste or um, uh, class or gender. So, within the Congress, there is a group or party called Congress Socialist Party and Lohia was actively involved in the politics or the activities of this party within the Congress and he served as an executive committee and also edited its weekly journal. So, for Lohia opposing the Congress as it is portrayed that he was first anti-Congress, but for Lohia opposing the Congress was not a major concern, but democratizing the society, the state, the polity was something he always fought for or stood for. So, against the colonial domination or against uh, dominis, political domination of one country by the other or the uh, uh, domination of one caste by the other. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Lohia uh, very interestingly considered the women as sudra across the all, uh, all, all uh, caste groups in Indian society. So, uh, he was uh, uh, trying to extend the democratization beyond the state and polity to, uh, to invade or to influence every sphere of human existence even the intimate relations between men and women across the caste in the society and all. So, uh, Lohia has a very uh, in that sense distinct or unique democratic imaginary which is yet to be retrieved or seriously uh, engaged with. 
So, for Lohia opposing the Congress was not a major concern as it is now being portrayed. So, when the socialists decided to leave the Congress after the independence, to form a separate party because of their growing dis difference with the Congress. Lohia was among the few leaders who opposed the decisions and argued for staying within the Congress. So, if you remember Gandhi was also trying to articulate the role of Congress after the attainment of independence and his articulation was not very favorably looked upon by many of his uh, followers within the Congress and there was a serious differences that emerged between Gandhi and his approach or his vision of post-independent India and many, uh, many Congress uh, leaders. But the socialist party uh, including Jayaprakash Narayan or uh, Lohia came closer to Gandhian politics and Gandhian ideals than many of his senior Congress leaders. So, nor did he advocate political allegiance right from the beginning. So, through the 1950s, Lohia opposed socialists taking part in the politics of alliance to form the government. It was only after the third general election that Lohia began to seriously look for possibility of forming an anti-Congress coalition. And this anti-Congress coalition for Lohia is to democratize the politics or democratize the electoral politics where uh, Congress party was ruling both the center and the uh, state and has a kind of uh, um, hegemonic status in Indian politics. Not to counter that or to uh, uh, counter such, um, uh, uh, such um, uh, dominance, he wanted some alternative uh, uh, forces to take the place of uh, uh, Congress as a kind of democratic um, uh, 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 approach or a kind of democratization of politics, state uh, uh, and electoral pol uh, politics in India. So, uh, as many uh, uh, critique or uh, maybe uh, sympathizer of Lohia tried to project him as the anti-Congress, but his anti-Congressism has to do more about democratizing the politics and the state than merely a kind of anti-Congress uh, Congress stand. So, Lohia wrote that Gandhians are of three kinds, firstly the priestly like those who uncritically followed the Gandhi and the Gandhian ideals and become the prophet or inherited or claimed to inherit the true legacy of Gandhi away from the state and its uh, institutions. So, there is a kind of one group or one kind of Gandhians which he claims as the priestly group. The second is the governmental state and institutions in modern India try to appropriate Gandhi and Gandhian legacy. And the third which he called Vijati or heretics Gandhi and he claims himself and the socialist party as the heretic Gandhian or uh, the third group of Gandhians. And so socialist party including himself uh, he claimed to be a heretic Gandhian. So the influence of Gandhian thought in Lohia is also therefore very much evident. Of course, he was very critical of many aspect of Gandhian politics and yet he was deeply influenced or took inspiration from Gandhian methods and Gandhian politics. So, it is questionable if all socialists could claim however, such inheritance of being heretic Gandhians. But Lohia politics was certainly located in this heretic tradition of Gandhians. So, after the independence, Lohia came in the limelight for championing the cause of Hindi as the official language and for the promotion of other Indian languages in place of English. So, he said, the use of English is a hindrance to original thinking, progenitor of inferiority feelings and a gap between the educated and uneducated public. Come, let us unite to restore Hindi to its original glory. So, his objection to English is not against a language as such, but against the status of a language which um, uh, hierarchize uh, those who think, speak, write and do politics in a particular language and those who speak, think and write in a particular language. So, uh, uh, Lohia has major problem with that kind of divide or that kind of hierarchy and therefore, he promoted or supported Hindi and many other Indian languages and this we can discuss in uh, one separate lecture on this. So, for such remarks, Ram and Lohia have been constantly portrayed merely as a Hindi wala or even a Hindu chauvinist by many of his critique. But however, this critique of reducing Lohia 
as a merely Hindi wala or a Hindi chauvinist is very far from true which we will discuss in detail when we will discuss Lohia's views on language. So, Lohia spoke about the need of a world government or a world citizen, but situated culture and tradition in a specific locales and therefore, his critique to the Eurocentric concepts or methods which is located or applicable only in a particular civilizational or historical context of Europe or America that cannot be blindly applied in a non-Western society and community. So, the specific locales and the culture and tradition of that society is very crucial in his vision of a world government or a world citizen. So, and context and celebrated therefore, the diversity and not the homogeneity. So, in Lohia and his politics and philosophy, we can also find the seeds of a politics that can resist any homogenizing and centralizing tendency in the politics or in the political thinking of a group or a party. So, the seeds of a politics that can resist homogenizing and centralizing tendency are inherent in the politics and the philosophy of Lohia. Lohia argued for equality between men and women against political, economic and racial inequalities for the destruction of caste which he considered as the root cause of uh, all social and economic injustices, against the foreign domination for economic equality, planned production and against private property, against interference in the private life and for democratic rights, for democracy or democratic rights and also fought against the arms and weapons and for Satyagraha in a way that represent the radical Gandhi in Lohia. So, in Lohia and his politics, we find a kind of simultaneous struggle against different form of injustices and not just uh, any one particular form of injustices and reducing to one agent or giving responsibility to one agent to bring about social and economic transformation as we see in many communist uh, uh, parties and their articulation. So, Lohia however, was unambiguous in his approach to caste. So, unlike many reformers or thinkers who look at caste as a problem, Lohia was very unambiguous in his, uh, in his approach. And according to him, the caste was the root cause of social and in economic inequality in India. And in order to build a just society, he also approached Ambedkar in 1950s. This was part of his attempts to build a broad based socialist party in India with a radical social justice as its, as its major objective or agenda. But before it could lead to any effective result, Ambedkar passed away and that is the tragedy of post-independent politics in modern India. So, in many ways, Lohia who offered a critique of capitalist modernity while advocating reservation as an instrument for the destruction of caste and classes was a bridge therefore, between the worlds of Gandhi and Ambedkar in the post-independence politics. So, according to Lohia, political movements suffer from error all the time. So, their actions in the present are performed in the hope of achieving some objectives in the distant future. So, many politics or political activities are carried out with an objective of achieving something in the distant future and that uh, politics may be suffering from some error of judgment, some uh, error of understanding. So, very often the link between the present and the future is rather complicated giving rise to the politics of remote justification, where all kinds of heinous acts or sins in the present are justified in the name of achieving something in distant future or some utopian thinking or utopian future. So, a recognition of this error, which many parties and most of the parties commit to uh, justify something in the present, which is unjustifiable in the name of achieving something in the distant future. So, this recognition or insightful fact in Lohia and his thought enables him to create a new normative framework which focuses on the present or the immanence in the politics of uh, transforming the society or creating a ideal society. So, according to Lohia, living in the present would mean that each action should have an ethical justification intrinsic to itself and not guided by some past or some future distant objectives that one has in the beginning. 
so let me mean that each action should have an ethical justification that is intrinsic to itself and not with reference to some distant future this would save us from the politics of fear or greed that is the root cause of all the problems in indian society or in many society the politics of fear and greed which is based on some ulterior motives or purposes and not embedded in the present or in the uh, 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 imminent or in the given uh, situation so for uh, loya the every act and the ethical justification for that uh, that act should be intrinsic to itself without taking justification from the distant future or past so this would save us from the politics of fear and greed lohia named it the principle of immediacy so this principle of immediacy ordains that each single act contains its own justification and there is a no need to call upon the succeeding act in order to justify what is done here and now so that's the politics he was arguing for so as someone born into a nationalist family and in the leadership of the congress socialist party his uncompromising opposition to colonial political dominations and a rejection to the colonizers claim of cultural supremacy were very much natural in that sense so yet lohia discovered that is more subtle and deeper form of eurocentrism persisted despite the political opposition to the colonial rule or the colonial subjugation so it tended to take two forms basically european diffusionism one and the euro normality as the second both of which lohia exposed and vigorously criticized in his writings and in many of his speech so basically the understanding of lohia is even when there is a political opposition to the political rule there is a more subtle and deeper uh, acceptance of uh, eurocentrism or euro um, um, an an uh, kind of euro diffusionism or normality uh, which is all pervasive and lohia was trying to fight against such kind of more subtle and deeper subjugation of um, uh, thought and thinking so european diffusionism is basically the belief that europe happened to be the place that had experienced some social and economic transformation so compared to other societies and civilization in modern times it is in the europe that there is a kind of serious political uh, development for social and um, economic uh, equality and not just uh, in the realm of uh, religion or spirituality so this european diffusionism is a belief that europe happened to be the place that had experienced some social and economic transformation that were universal in scope and would therefore gradually spread all over the world so this those who believe that the experience of the european society will gradually spread all over the world that we call westernization or modernization of the world and modernization is particularly seen as a european experience as a kind of so europe becomes the criteria the basis for judging the modernization or westernization of any society and economy so those who believed in this kind of european diffusionism believed in such kind of gradual spread of this experience in different parts of world however uh, lohia argued that the path of development followed by the european civilization and its extension would not be open to the rest of the world especially the non european country and society in fact in his opinion it was neither required nor desirable as it may not lead to desired ends of socialism in the non western society or the ideal society so the application or the blind imitation of such ideas may have some harmful consequences on the non european society than the positive results so lohia was against the assumptions of euro normality also built into all the dominant knowledge forms and political ideology so for him the prevailing ideology of modern civilization its normativity principle and theoretical generalization were of limited european derivation and equally limited in its applicability to understand or interpret realities in non european societies so even when there is a kind of common uh, consensus about the use of western vocabulary and method to interpret and uh, understand non european society lohia developed uh, this uh, critique uh, 
in the high time of such kind of uh, scholarly discourse about the use of or the application of eurocentric views and concepts to understand and examine the society but this besides even when he was so critical or visionary and yet there is a very less engagement with this aspect of his thought uh, even when now in the intellectual in the field of knowledge production there is increasing discomfort with the eurocentrism uh, in uh, india or around the world so they had to be treated as provincial unless proven otherwise so there is no kind of then the narrow chauvinistic kind of approach to the ideas coming from other parts or other traditions um, in lohia and he was championing for universalism but that universalism should not be guided by the experience and the uh, concepts of one particular uh, culture or society so for lohia capitalism and communism were uh, but two faces of modern civilization that had reached a dead end so it is not liberatory or it is not emancipatory anymore because both capitalism and communism has reached a dead end so modern civilization lohia writes no matter what its initial urges may have been has become a complex consisting of production of remote effect tool of remote production democracy of remote second rate application and even class struggle of remote justification in this regard lohier's critique of modern civilization appears very much in line with and more subtle and fully developed than gandhi's views on modern civilization so lohier was also someone engaged with the subtle and the deeper form of uh, injustices or the colonization or the colonization of the thought process that was resulted because of the modern civilization which we need to seriously engage with so conceptualizing real modernity lohia distinguished between a side looking and a forward looking world view or politics so a side looking world view involved no independent thinking but simply imitating or replicating the modern civilization of europe and us all over the world so european diffusionism in a sense and a true modernity would then in lohier's thought would be involving a forward looking world view that so whatever is suitable or rational in both of them the backward looking and the side looking people adopt that real modernity is that the world has to be reconstructed from this and that he developed in the wheels of history and in many of his uh, uh, writings to conceptualize modernity in a um, distinct way free from the european uh, um, influence or uh, eurocentric uh, dominance so he developed this into a distinction between cosmopolitanism and universalism and argued for universalism as a desired objective or a desired goal for a modern uh, society and polity in his opinion a cosmopolite is premature universalist an imitator of superficial attainments of dominant civilization an inhabitant of upper caste milieu without real contact with the people so for him uh, the universalism is something which is desirable and cosmopolitan is a kind of obstruction and those cosmopolitan elites are actually unconnected or uh, or 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 uh, without having real contact with their own people so he held the cosmopolitan elites or cosmopolites responsible for all that was wrong with the post independent indian politics and he was referring here to nehru or the politics of many communist party who was trying to create a kind of world citizen or world uh, government without engaging or connecting themselves with the real people or the real masses of india so he however in this difference between cosmopolitan and universalism he hardly developed his own conception of universalism or what does that universalism entails but he developed a kind of distinction between cosmopolitanism and supported universalism in comparison to cosmopolitan elites which actually a kind of premature or a kind of unconnect with the real people so lohia uh, rebelled not just against colonial political domination but equally against the cultural and the intellectual domination of west as we have seen and he outgrew a simple minded nationalism 
to develop a critique of eurocentrism from the vantage point of universalism it opened him to learning from indian history mythology and intellectual traditions without closing his eyes to the based in global heritage of ideas so he was inspired by the global ideas uh, or the ideas coming from other traditions but also deeply embedded in the indian tradition indian history and the mythology to explain to grasp the indian reality and then develop a politics which can uh, transform this society to create it more uh, equal more just and more ideal so the vantage point of universalist but not cosmopolite forward looking and not side looking allowed lohier to develop an uncompromising critique of both eurocentrism and of elements in indian tradition that cannot stand rational scrutiny so he was also critical of those practices beliefs in indian tradition which cannot stand the rational scrutiny so at the same time his political moorings in the socialist movement meant an uncompromising adherence to the ideals of equality and this ideals of equality remains the basis of all his politics and his thought so he outgrew the received and narrow focus on economic equality within a country and expanded the notion to include both internal and external equality so within a nation inequality of income or uh, social inequality in terms of uh, caste should go so internal inequality and also external equality it is freedom from political domination of one country by the other and also equality in gender caste and race that he argued for so it is interesting that the mandal revolution transformed the politics in north india but the ideological ground for obc empowerment was prepared by lohia as i was saying both intellectually or ideologically and also organizationally however that legacy of uh, uh, lohia is not subjected to a critical engagement or to engage uh, with his works and many the many critic uh, develop their uh, uh, definite opinion on lohia and his works even without reading his uh, text and his speeches so this obc empowerment especially the post mandal politics which has transformed the politics uh, especially the electoral politics we uh, need to perhaps revisit many of the ideals that uh, lohia was arguing for but is absent from the uh, contemporary politics in the name of socialism or uh, even when giving a symbolic allegiance to lohia we need to revisit some of the ideals that he was arguing for however this outside the realm of electoral politics numerous new social movements in india and their leaders are part of a stream that counts lohia as one among its many sources including gandhi uh, jay prakash and many others uh these uh, leaders or these new social movements considered lohia as one of their source of inspiration or motivation to fight for all kind of discrimination or injustices so ram manohar lohia contributed significantly to the formulation of an intersectionalist approach so this intersectionalist which cut across caste class gender is something very unique and innovative in lohia politics and his thought so for understanding the inequalities exclusions and exploitation in the power system of india so this is a more comprehensive approach to understand injustices exploitation in many forms and then to have a uh, simultaneous uh, struggle uh, against those forms of exploitations and injustices and not reducing it to one group or one uh, agent for such um, uh, struggle for justice so this was highly significant for interrogating the dynamics of power as well as the key determinants of the matrix of power based on caste class as we uh, uh, closely look at his ideas on caste uh, and class and also on socialism and especially his views on uh, 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 language so in the next two lecture we are going to more uh, uh, critically engage with uh, his views on caste and class socialism and also on language to understand uh, lohia's intersectionalist approach to fight against uh, many injustices and exploitation 
and to see the uh, nexus of uh, 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 power uh, based on or the uh, matrix of such power relations based on caste, class, gender and languages. So, on this lecture you can refer to some of this uh, work, one by Raman or Lohia, his life and philosophy by Indumatikar. This is the best biography so far published on uh, Lohia and his thought. Some of the text you can also look at to understand Lohia and his politics is what is living and what is dead in Raman or Lohia by Yogendra Yadav. Also on remembering Lohia by Yogendra Yadav, this you can find in economic and political weekly. Raman or Lohia and appreciation by Gopal Krishna, this can also give you a kind of wider view and also to locate Lohia in the larger politics of post-independent India. So, this text by Gopal Krishna you can also find in EPW 1968. Also, Raman or Lohia by Mast Ram Kapoor in Economic Political Weekly and Mast Ram Kapoor has also compiled all the writings of Lohia in multiple volumes which can be a better source or richer source to understand many aspects of Lohia and his politics. And also understanding Lohia's political sociology, intersectionality of caste, class, gender and language by Anand Kumar you can refer to. So, these are some of the texts which you can refer to understand Lohia and his politics. So, that is all for today's lecture. Thank you. Thanks for listening.